that at all. It's very curious. When I was a, a, a student, more decades ago than I care to say, uh, it was um, generally assumed that life began as a freak chemical accident and that it would be restricted just to Earth. Uh, and the idea that there may be life anywhere else in the universe, which excited me, uh, there was almost nobody to speak for it. It was considered mm. uh, a, almost a crackpot idea. And over the last 30 years, the pendulum has swung the other way. And it's now fashionable to suppose that the universe is teeming with life and that there's probably intelligent life out there somewhere. And people say, oh, the universe is so vast, must be the case uh, that there's going to be life there somewhere. None of this is true. The scientific facts haven't changed. Mm -hmm. uh, all we know now that uh, we didn't know when I was a student is that there are going to be other Earth-like planets out there. But we guess that there probably were. We have no idea how life began. We have no idea what the chemical steps were that preceded it and whether these steps are uh, likely or exceedingly unlikely. So, so you would dispute that the, the Carl Sagan's big equation he used to put up on a blackboard about the probability. That's right, the, the, the Drake equation. Right, the Drake equation. Named after his, Frank Drake. His, his mentor. There right. are two terms in that equation where the error bars are enormous. The first is the probability that life will emerge on an Earth-like planet, if you've got one. Uh, that's anywhere from zero to one, uh, anywhere from certainty uh, to it's uh, a unique event. And the other is that uh, once life gets going, what is the probability that intelligence will evolve? Uh, we know that, uh, that Darwin in evolution is blind. It's not directed anywhere. It's just groping around. And there's no guarantee that intelligence is going to emerge. It might. It has mm -hmm. survival value, but so do other biological aspects. And mm -hmm. so we... we we have only one sample of life to work with. That's why it's so important if we had two samples of life, we could separate the general features from the special features. But mm -hmm. at the moment, we just don't know. So it's all wishful thinking. And the great thing about astrobiology is that we're doing something about it. We're actually trying to get the answers and reduce those error bars. Mm -hmm. Aaron, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, I don't want to disagree in general with what Paul's saying. I think he's exactly right. But there's a reason that the fashion changed. And there was a change in our, in our understanding of some of the science. Um, which is in the last 30 years, we've come to realize just how, how diverse the different ways are that life can make a living and, and the diversity of environments in which life can survive. And I think that is what has changed the fashion that, that now we know, as you alluded to in your introduction, uh, life can exist in very strange environments, environments we, nobody would have thought life could exist in uh, 30 years ago. And so naturally that leads people to think, well, maybe it's a lot more probable. Well, and, what, and, and what's wrong with that thinking? You know, he, he, it, it's, he fi it. it's fine thinking, but it's a, it leads to a hypothesis that right, you need to test. It's just a hypothesis. But, but it's all the same life, you see. It's just one mm. sample of life. It's spread uh, to places we didn't think it could survive in. But it doesn't tell us anything about how probable it is that life gets going in the first place. What is the chance that some chemical mix will transform itself into life? It could be something that happens readily and easily and all mm. around the universe, which I hope, I mean, I'd love to believe that the universe is teeming with life, but we don't know. We don't have it any could, evidence. It could, we have no evidence, no evidence because we don't know what happened. Barry, what do you think about this? Well, <clears throat> the, the importance of these extreme files was seen pretty early on in the formation of the astrobiology program and in the institute. We funded a great deal of the early work on it. And that was mostly, that, the reason we funded is that's what the scientists wanted to do. And I think it's, it's, it's just led to all these intriguing uh, possibilities, as well, by the way, as potential commercial applications, because you're dealing with organisms that are uh, operating under near mm -hmm. industrial conditions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, again, the, Paul's point is, is very well taken, this, this, this switch from, um, from uh, inorganic material into having long chain biological information, functional containing biological particles, particles, pieces, molecules, and that is the is is the a crucial part of the origins issue. So you you almost sound like uh, when you talk to the physicists that's saying about well, there's string theory, it's a great theory, but there's no way really to test it out now. That the theory that there might be intelligent life in the universe is a great theory, but we haven't been able to test it out. We can test it. We can test it with SETI, the, the search right. for extraterrestrial intelligence, and, and that's 50 years old next year. Uh, and these uh, courageous astronomers have been scouring the skies with radio telescopes, hoping to stumble across a message. Well, from let me ET. throw your own have, let me throw your own argument back at you. You're one who believes that we might find other forms of life on on the planet here that we don't recognize. Might, might SETI be looking for signals? 
for forms of life that, that, are, that are sending out different kinds of signals that we don't recognize. Uh, yeah, it's entirely likely. Uh, we naturally think of radio. The usual argument is that uh, ET will be smarter than we are, so surely they will adapt their technology to what they know that we can cope with. And radio is, is a pretty good way to do it. So I think that's a, a good strategy, but I think that we need to think outside the box a bit more on this subject after 50 years and, and only an eerie silence out there. Mm -hmm. Uh, one 800 9898255 let us let us go to the phones here. Also, you can uh, Twitter us at SciFry. That's at SciFry if you'd like to send us a, a Twitter. Uh, Sharon in Iowa City, hi. Welcome to Science Friday. Hi, there. how's it going? Go ahead. Um, yeah, I just had a question about, uh, I, I once read about uh, the possibility of silicon forms where the, the carbon was basically replaced with long chains of, of silicon. Is, uh, is there any research on that? Yeah, that's a, that's a staple of Star Trek, I think, right? Yeah, let, me, let me butt in there. Go ahead. Uh, 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 Peter Ward. Steve Benner from the University of Florida has suggested that if we go to Titan, and personally, I once sent into Seed Magazine an editorial that we should skip Mars and Europa and go straight to Titan. It's an easier landing. You've got an atmosphere. And it's the only place where you really could get major alien life, non-carbon life. And you replace silica into, in those temperatures, silica makes the equivalent of long chains. It's called silanes. There's the whole chemistry of silane and silane chemistry that Benner and others suggest that the life there would be as alien as anything you could imagine, and that under the conditions where methane comes out as snow, where you have giant lakes of gasoline, you're really looking at alien conditions cooler than any place closer. Hmm. So go, go to Saturn, go to Titan. not to Jupiter. Yeah. Titan, Titan, Titan. Titan, Titan, Titan. Um, uh, our number is 202-513-2530. If you have a question here, please come on up to the microphone and uh, ask your question. That's, that's interesting. Go, go to Titan. Thank you for taking my question, mm -hmm. Lyle Berkey. Uh, my question is in regards to, uh, to you know, in, in planets uh, where the conditions are much different than our own, where would the, the energy, uh, hypothetically, be derived from for, for these life forms? Would it primarily be uh, through light from the sun, photosynthesis or uh, something entirely different? Who wants the job? We'll start at this end and work down. Ariel? So, so what we've learned also in the last 30 years in particular is that uh, you know, photosynthesis is, a, is a, probably a relatively late development in the history of the Earth, maybe a third of the way through Earth history, something like that probably, as argued. Um, there are other forms of life uh, that, are, that, are, that are simpler that make use of chemical energy, that make use of chemical reactions, almost like, like batteries. Um, and many bacteria and so-called archaea in particular, uh, do those sorts of things. And so probably that's what, we're, that's what we tend to be biased towards, uh, towards looking for, um, at least when we talk about Mars or, or, or Titan or Europa. Um. Well, in Europa, one of the potential, so, or probably actual sources of energy is the eccentric orbit, uh, which elongates, makes it kind of oval and then circular and back and forth again. And that generates it. And there's another interesting notion that um, I, there's been some uh, consideration of, and that's the possibility of uh, small amounts of pizio electricity. That is, when you have micrometeorites, that, which are constant, there are tons of them, uh, they would generate a small amount of uh, electricity at a local area in the ice and snow. Uh, and a fascinating idea, a little, little kind of local environment that something might happen. Hmm. But I think we, we know very little about that right now. Talking about astrobiology on Science Friday from NPR News. Uh, thanks for that question. And Dr. Bloomberg, are, are there any real plans to go to Europa now? Uh, yeah, uh, I believe it's now in the uh, NASA uh, schedule, uh, schedule. Mm -hmm. and uh, that, uh, that it was actually kind of one out uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as opposed to going to Titan uh, because, you know, funds are limited. These, uh, uh, these uh, researchers are extraordinarily expensive, you know, launches themselves yeah. cost tens of millions. Yeah. So I, I think uh, um, Europe is back on schedule and Titan still in reserve, is that? Well, I mean, let me just probe that a little bit more, so to speak. Um, uh, I know Arthur C. Clarke wrote about 2001 Space Odyssey and then 2010, and he went right to that, those spots. Have people been thinking about it that long to go to Jupiter and the moons of Jupiter, that, that, that this is a natural progression where science fiction is preceding science fact again? Well, as you know, very often when we have NASA and space-related conferences, we invite science fiction people, you know, we recognize they mm -hmm. kind of leave the field. In the movie Gattaca, by the way, one of the 
tar the target for the space exploration of the time was uh, was to Titan, uh, actually. Hmm. Uh, yes, I, uh, the um, the great advantage of uh, science uh, fiction is that it's kind of unlimited by. Uh, Reality. I mean, that's why it's fiction. But, well, <laughs> but Asimov has been right so. And I mean, uh, uh, he's been right. Uh, he's been right so many times. I figured that maybe he was really in on the the, kind of the considerations, and it was talked about among scientists 30, 40 years ago. Yes. So, yeah. Yes. Um, Peter, talk. Tell us about uh, India and the ultraviolet experiments that are that are going on there. Well, we are actually building laboratories and chambers trying to produce past Earth atmospheres, but we can also produce other planet atmospheres. And one of the things that's really scaring us to death is we look at the past mass extinctions, and for the last 20, 30 years, everybody says impact. I mean, Bruce mm -hmm. Willis saved us from the big asteroid, and, and, and where is Bruce when the next one comes around? And NASA and the public believes that this is the major threat. And yet we've now found that four of the past five mass extinctions were caused by microbes. Mm -hmm. Microbes attacking us and that the future of the Earth, one of warming, turns out that global warming is the scariest thing that can happen to a planet because the bad microbes come back. So we are building situations trying to look at Earth, let's say, 75 years from now and what we're going to look at when we have temperatures going up five or six or even seven degrees. I, I think we're really on a cusp of a planetary disaster that is 